The following episode contains discussions of sexual and physical violence. Listener discretion is advised. It's 1974 in the suburb of Hamilton, which is about four kilometres from the heart of Newcastle. The area is surrounded by incredible natural beauty, lots of bushland and sprawling beaches, an idyllic backdrop for an Australian childhood. Many of the working class families in the suburbs of Newcastle are Catholic. Catholics belong to a parish, which has a church and a local priest. The Catholic schools in the area promise to propel students into the professional classes. Maybe they'd grow up and become a teacher or a nurse or a journalist or even a priest themselves. The three main schools in this particular diocese are Morris Brothers Hamilton, St Pius in the nearby suburb of Adamstown and Morris Brothers Maitland. Two of these schools are, as their names suggest, run by Morris Brothers, who are an international religious community of men dedicated to educating young people. Being part of the church offers hope and a profound sense of community. But on the 8th of October, 1974, something unimaginable happens. A boy named Andrew Nash loses his life. It will take decades for his family to discover what happened to him. And his story is only the beginning. There's another boy in his class named Glenn Walsh, He's heavily involved in the church, so much so that he was once an altar boy, serving alongside a priest at Mass. Then there's Stephen Allwood, who also used to be an altar boy, a childhood friend of Glenn's. He'd grow up to be a very well-respected journalist. Andrew Nash, Glenn Walsh, Stephen Allwood. Three boys, all in Catholic schools in the Newcastle area, all with an experience in common all who died prematurely. There's a single thread that ties them all together. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Suzanne Smith, Suzanne is a six-time Walkley Award-winning investigative reporter whose 27-year career in journalism has included senior editorial roles at the ABC, including on Foreign Correspondent, Background Briefing, Late Line and ABC News. During her time at the ABC, she reported on the cover-up of clerical abuse, which helped to trigger the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse in Australia. Her new book, Alter Boys, is a powerful expose of widespread and organised clerical abuse of children in one Australian city and how the cover-up in the Catholic Church extended from parish priests to every echelon of the organisation. I want to begin in October 1974 when Audrey Nash uh, goes upstairs to check on her son, Andrew. What does she find? So that was a terrible, terrible night for Audrey. Her youngest son at that point, Andrew, who was only 13, had come home from school, but he was very quiet. And he went to his bedroom. It was actually Bernadette, his younger sister, who went into the room and was looking for a rubber. And all Audrey could hear were these screams, just like an animal, just these screams from Bernadette. So Audrey runs in and finds Andrew hanging from the back door. So she calls out to her other son, Jeffrey Nash, and says, help me, help me. But unfortunately, this 13-year-old is already dead and they lay him on the floor. And the whole household goes into shock. They're just totally shocked. This was a 13-year-old boy that went to Morris Brothers Hamilton, who was loved by everyone, who was in the school choir, who was in year eight. And there he is. And That's where the story starts. Were there any signs in the lead up? Because it's so shocking to think that someone who is 13 could do something like that. What what did the weeks prior been like? And when they looked back, was there anything that they felt they'd missed? Well, Audrey kept racking her brain. She thought, why would my son do this? At that point, she didn't want to believe it was suicide. She thought perhaps he'd done something in a prank. But... 
Later on, she was thinking, well, you know, a couple of weeks ago, he came back from the local ocean baths in Newcastle called Bar Beach. There's some local baths. And he'd been very subdued. And then in the last couple of months, he didn't want to go to school. And this was very unusual for this 13-year-old boy who was often sort of telling jokes. And there was a period of a few months when his personality changed and he really didn't want to go to school and she used to force him to go to school. But the terrifying thing happened a bit later on in that night when the priests and brothers arrived. So they were obviously part of the church um, and so the priests and, and brothers did arrive. What happened then? Straight after Andrew dies, Audrey doesn't have a phone. It's 1974. They're a poor Catholic family. Her husband's out on some merchant ship off the coast of Wollongong. So she runs into the street desperately looking for a taxi and finds one and says, get my parish priest, Murray Cale. Murray Cale was away. So the first priest that arrives is Father Bill Burston and he comes in. And then a short time later, two other priests arrive that she hasn't called for. And they're the principal of a local school called St Pius X. Tom Brennan and his deputy. And she's thinking, I didn't call for you. Why are you here? And there's a deputy who's called Father Pat Helferty. And then three Maris brothers arrive, which is Brother Christopher Wade, Brother John O'Brien and Brother Romuald. And she's got all these clerics and religious in her lounge room. And, you know, she's sobbing. The whole house is sobbing. They're they're grief-stricken. The men form a huddle in her lounge room. And then Brother Romuald comes to her and says, did Andrew leave a note? And Audrey says no and says, did anything happen at school today? What's going on with my son sort of thing? And they said no. And then they formed a little huddle again and they left. And you've got to remember this, this is a mother with a 13-year-old child who is dead on the floor. These men have come to find out if he's left a note. They pay their condolences and, and leave But that's the last time Audrey sees any of those men and they're supposed to be, as a Catholic, I mean, I was brought up Catholic, your local priests and brothers are supposed to give you pastoral care. She doesn't see them again. And that was one sign the police thought there's something more to this. But how chilling, a mother sobbing, just lost her son and Romuald, who was his class teacher, asks Audrey, did he leave a note? No. Did he say anything? No. And they leave. Then... They have to get a message to Bert, Audrey's husband and Andrew's dad, who's on a ship off the coast of Wollongong. He comes home. He has to get a taxi from Sydney and he's devastated and he essentially ends up drinking himself to death with depression. And that's where the story starts. And that's part of this red flag. He's the youngest person we know in that area, in the Hunter, Newcastle, that's suicided. And that's the red flag. In 1974, this 13-year-old boy And that was the treatment his mother got. And how did the church respond in the weeks and months afterwards? So boys went to school the next day expecting to see their friend who wasn't there. How did they reconcile what had happened? So there was an announcement at the assembly. Brother Christopher Wade was the principal and he'd been there the night before at Audrey's house. And he informed the boys that uh, Andrew died, but... Where it even gets more appalling is that the boys hear uh, these rumours from particular Maris brothers and particular priests. One rumour was that Geoffrey Nash, Andrew's older brother, had been playing with him and Andrew's tide got caught on the back hook of the door. Another Maris brother told some other boys that um, Andrew and Geoffrey had been playing on the hill's hoist in the backyard and that Andrew's tide got caught. There was all these rumours to dispel any notion that this boy, there was something bad happening to this little boy and that he would have killed himself. And in the Royal Commission recently, they were questioned about that. And that was confirmed that already we're seeing the signs of cover-up in that those very mm. early days in 1974. In that community was another boy who was growing up named Glenn. What sort of upbringing did he have? Was it similar to Andrew in that it was like a Catholic family, um, they didn't have a lot of money? Was that sort of the cultural 
you know. Milieu, absolutely. Yeah. So Glenn Walsh lived in Shortland, which was a really Catholic neighbourhood. And back in the 70s, you're a bit young for that, but me, you know, Catholics tended to live in enclaves and, you know, the publics were down the other end of the suburb. You never visited the publics. So Glenn was in Year 7. Andrew was in Year 8 at Mara's Brother Hamilton and they were in the choir together and they were, were from really, really devout Catholic families with quite a few kids and, you know, they were both considered to be prime people for the priesthood and that was what it was like, you know. Back in those days it was um, such an honour if one of your siblings or sons became a priest and they eventually became very close to Glenn later on but, um, yes, they were, they were enmeshed in this Catholic culture saying the rosary, saying special masses. And it is a very strong culture, you know, growing up Catholic. There's all sort of secret language and there's all sort of rituals and you're very much part of a very close community. And it was very much like that back in those days. You have some accounts in the book about some things that happened in sex ed lessons or surveys that boys were given, which now you would look at it and think that's completely unbelievable that something would take place actually in almost quite a public setting because it was happening in a classroom in front of a lot of people. What sort of things were these boys being asked and what conversations were happening with those brothers or priests who were around them? Yes, it would never happen now. Absolutely. But back in the 70s, I mean, part of this story is about the fact that these priests and brothers who were pedophiles were running schools and the state had abrogated their responsibilities to these children. They, they handed them over to the church, really, and they didn't actually scrutinise them. So I've interviewed a lot of boys that went to school with Glenn and Andrew during that time. It's a pretty shocking story, so I'm warning your listeners before I tell it, but there was one brother at um, Morris Brothers ha- Hamilton called Brother Cashin, and he was very violent, a man filled with rage, and he used to give these sex education classes. Now we have, you know, good sex education where there's a lot of information but what he used to do these poor year seven boys would be shown slideshows of images and the first image might be a frog and then the next image would be a car crash and then the third image would be a woman with a distended belly with her labia showing like he was trying to frighten the boys off sex rather than actually tell them what what sex was and I know one of the men I interviewed said that they were so frightened some of the boys used to hold each other's hands. And Brother Cashin used to give these lectures in this tone of, I know what you boys want to see. So what I try and explain in the book is all these brothers and priests had taken an oath of celibacy and they'd gone to these seminaries and novitiates as young students themselves and been told sex was bad and this then they were sent out into the schools. And Brother Romuald used to do these sex education surveys where he'd get the year seven and eight boys to fill out their surveys and tell him whether they'd had orgasms yet. And, you know, I mean, it was obviously titillation for him, but it was was all, you know, grooming. This is grooming. This is grooming the boys, getting them ready to be assaulted. And what really struck me about this period, and Catholic schools are not like this now, but back then is that people must have known about it, must have been tolerated. Absolutely. And it's a grooming, as you express in in the book, of almost an entire community. It is. That's what they did. See, what I was trying to explain is the recipe for an epidemic of pedophilia in The Hunter in Newcastle, this is it. You've got devout community, you've got dads working three jobs, you've got poor communities who are desperate for help from the church and then their boys go to school and that's their ticket out of poverty into uni, they've got these brothers and priests that are, you know, just stunted human beings looking after them. I mean, the children didn't stand a chance in Mm. that environment because as I reveal in the book, the principals of those three schools that all those Catholic boys went to were all pedophiles at the same time. Um, Another boy who was served as an altar boy with Glenn was Stephen Allwood and you knew him personally what sort of relationship did he have eventually have with a man named Father John Denham? Yes, that's a psychological nightmare, that relationship. It's quite funny because where we're doing the interview, I met Stephen here. This used to be the ABC radio studios wow. and we met here and it's in the book actually, so it's quite spooky sitting here and talking about him. So Stephen grew up with Glenn in Shortland across the road and Glenn went to Morris Brothers Hamilton 
and Stephen went to St Pius the Tenth, and the two people that turned up at Audrey's house that night were the principal of St Pius the Tenth, who was a child sex offender, and his deputy. Anyway, Stephen goes off to that school. His parents think they're sending him to a better school that will have less violence, but in fact, it's just out of the fry pan into the fire. And when he gets there, by year nine in 1975, the head of discipline is Father John Denham. Now, Father John Denham is a predatory pedophile. He's a monster. He ends up sexually assaulting 65 boys. And he was head of discipline there and he used to call the boys in to his quarters. So back in those days, which is very rare now, both at Morris Brothers Hamilton and St Pius, the priests lived on site, the brothers lived on site. And Father Denham used to take the boys into his quarters and sexually assault them or he'd bring them to uh, his office to do book reviews. And Stephen met him. Now, Stephen came from a working class family. His dad worked at BHP. He was brilliant. And back in the day, Newcastle was very much a town and to be an intellectual back then was very hard. And what Denham did to Stephen was manipulate him psychologically and tell him how great he was and... Uh, heap praise on him and give him so much attention about his brilliance and talk to him about Latin and music and all these things. He was like a bumptious academic, but was all part of his grooming. So Stephen's dad worked at BHP. He was a working class guy. So the sort of intellectual nourishment that Stephen was looking for, he got from this priest. And that's why it's such a screwed up psychological relationship between a priest and a, a victim, because, you know, back when they're teenagers, they sort of look at them as a quasi-father, but also they're taught father, mm. John Denham, plus they're taught, the students are taught they're divine. And essentially, Father John Denham, that's the other thing a lot of these pedophile priests do, they stay with the victim right till the end of their lives, mm. which is not not like a lot of the others. And he basically tortured Steve until he died, psychologically. And Glenn, he went on to decide to study to be a priest. So he then went to join the the priesthood and while he was there, he was subject to abuse. What happened to him? The Morris brothers back in the day came up with a brilliant scheme called the Better Boys Scheme because they were running out of brothers. Not many people were entering. And so they came up with this scheme that they'd take a lot of the year 11 and 12 boys down to Mittagong to a retreat centre And one of the leaders down there was a brother called Coman Sykes, and he was the former principal of North Shore, Myra's Brothers, at North Sydney, Parramatta. Uh, He was at Canberra. He was at Cogra. He was at all the Myra's Brothers. Anyway, when Glenn leaves year 12 in 1980, he decides to become a Myra's Brother. So instead of a priest, he decides to become a brother. And he goes to the novitiate in Sydney, and he has a year there. And that's where he meets Brother Coman Sykes. Brother Coman Sykes sexually assaults him for a year. And Brother Coman Sykes is 30 years older than him. And in that context, Coman Sykes is the superior at that place. You know, it's such a betrayal for a senior teacher to do that. By the end of the year, Glenn is sick and exhausted and decides to leave. He ends up finishing his teaching diploma and he becomes a teacher And then he goes to Papua New Guinea for a year and tries to get away from the abuse. In the book, I'm trying to work out why was Glenn Walsh so different from so many other priests, why, which you'll find out later, he goes to the police and reports a pedophile priest and encourages a victim to go to the police. Why was he so different? And I think that experience of being sexually assaulted as a vulnerable adult, he was 18, he knew what it was like to be a victim and he knew the shame and he knew how much it's corrosive in your life. And I think that really, that terrible experience really sets him up because he puts in a complaint against Coman Sykes in 1998, which the Morris brothers say isn't true. But interestingly, in the months before his death, before the priest dies, they reverse it and say, actually, it is sustained. You refer to the shame that he felt and how there must have been compassion that he felt with other victims and that's why he was so drawn to to actually say what had happened to him and and he was instrumental in in having some of these men go to prison. There will be listeners who are wondering why boys who are abused in a situation that looks so black and white to us now in terms of perpetrator and victim don't come forward. Why he didn't in that situation go to the police, go to 
the head of whoever was in charge of that particular sort of school that he was studying at. Why is it, and this is a theme throughout the whole book, that it can take boys, you know, 40, 50 years to say anything? Why do you think that is? So the terrible tragedy of this story is that we've now got 71 men who have suicided in those from those three schools. We know they're all abused by clergy or brothers. Some of them some of them died from risky behaviour, but we all think it's, the families say it's all related. And quite a few of those men never told their families or their partners. And it's all about shame. So Glenn still felt at that time, back in 1998 and, and when he was assaulted in 1980, he still had faith in the church that they would do something. His parents are very devout and he didn't want to upset them. And there's all this... Many of the men in my book don't go to the police until their parents have died. Mm. And I think they their parents put them through these schools and they don't want their parents to feel guilty. They're trying to they're trying to shield them from the hurt. Can you imagine being a mother mm. and you've sent your boy and often these priests used to look after these boys and the the parents would think, "Oh, isn't that wonderful?" So there's a lot of guilt. The Royal Commission found that it takes 25 years on average for a man to tell someone, and I think that's it's less for women. In the story, Stephen doesn't tell anyone about his sexual abuse of Denham until he's driving to Goulburn Jail with his brother. And he's driving to Goulburn Jail, Supermax, because he wants to confront Father John Denham in jail. And he doesn't tell his brother till he's in the car. He doesn't tell his partner ever. His partner found out after he died. And I think there's so much shame, but there's also so many of the parents didn't believe them. Mm. There are stories in, in the book of parents who reprimanded their children or told them that they were lying or that it wasn't possible because that man's a priest. So That's right. Th- therefore, it doesn't add up. These poor boys saw their parents struggle to send them to these schools. They didn't want to, you know, upset their parents but also there were instances at St Pius the 10th when boys went to the principal and he whipped them and he was charged over that there's a lot of discipline a lot of violence in the schools I think a lot of these boys were frightened actually I think they were frightened and they were frightened of the brothers and priests and they were frightened you know there was a lot of domestic violence back then there was a lot of you know a lot of these boys that were targeted not Stephen and Glenn or, or Andrew but a lot of the boys were from dysfunctional families so they were vulnerable kids it's just a perfect storm unfortunately and part of the reason I wanted to put it is this is the perfect storm to create this scourge of pedophilia and we have to learn from it but you know there's still men suiciding I interviewed the head of strike force Georgiana who is just such a hero she's put away 19 priests and brothers And she describes in the book why it's different to be sexually assaulted by a priest or brother than a normal child sex offender. There's just this added layer of something about them being divine, something about, you know, we were all taught how wonderful these men were. When priests came into my own house, my mother would get out the best cutlery. You know, they were treated like kings back then. Mm. And you believe as a child that they are almost the mouthpiece for God. Well, they are. Yeah. They are actually Jesus Christ. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so to um, think they can't do anything wrong. So that would be no. so conflicting in your own mind to know whether what's happening is, is wrong or not because for a lot of these when they say that they know it felt wrong but everything in their world was telling them that it wasn't. There was a, a huge sense of entitlement from these men that they sort of owned the kids and I have to say, not Andrew, Stephen and Glenn, but with a lot of other cases, the police have said that, you know, partly it was the parents' blind faith and we have to be honest with that. Mm. I mean, we wouldn't send our children away now with priests and brothers for weekends, but, you know, that exactly. happened. Exactly, but that was know. part of their grooming as well. That was They groomed the parents, mm. they groomed the schools, they groomed the kids, but, you know, there's so many up there, so there's a lot of people mm. that still know stuff that hasn't come forward. There's still investigations going on. And the subsequent cover-ups, which took place in almost all of these cases, you talk about something called the pontifical secret. Secret. Everyone latches onto that. Yeah. Can you explain what that means? So back in 1974, which is the same year Andrew died, the Pope at the time decreed the pontifical secret to all Catholic clergy and brothers and nuns and everyone in the Catholic Church. If you knew 
about an investigation into a brother, a priest or a nun, you were not allowed to go to the police. And if you did, you could be excommunicated. This was decreed because by 1974, a lot of cases were starting to pop up and we had Vatican II and we had a... The community started to change. You know, a big reason we've now got so many convictions is the community's changed too. Like... Uh, we've got much higher standards, we've got better child protection standards. But back then, there was just these inklings from people that there was this child abuse epidemic, so the Pope did this. And also, on top of the pontifical secret, the church set up its own treatment centres called Encompass, and they used to send people there for this treatment, and then they'd come back into the communities and just offend again. So it's a web of secrecy that extends from, you know, Ballarat, Newcastle, look, all the way to the Vatican. Mm. Recently, Pope Francis has wound that back and said that if you are operating in a country where there are civil laws and you must go to the police, you must obey the civil law, that's a great step forward. But my concern is is that the celibacy laws haven't changed in the Catholic Church. They still protect the confessional. I'm not sure that enough changes has been made at the top. And also, where are the women at the top? You pointed to the celibacy, which is an interesting point, and this is something that's discussed a lot and is touched on in the book as well. Do you think this is a case of an institution turning men into pedophiles or into men who commit acts of violence against children, or is it an institution that attracts men that are like that already? What do you think it is? So there's a huge debate on this. Christy Faber, who's head of Strike Force Georgiana, she says they're pedophiles to start with and they know that that's a safe haven and they can be looked after. We're talking in the past. We're not talking now. We're talking in the past. Others will say that some of the boys went to the seminary to learn to be priests when they were 14. Their whole sexual formation was there. They often had sexual relations with other boys and men older than them. I believe a lot of these priests and brothers might have been abused and then that sets them on the path. What I do know about Maitland Newcastle for those decades is it was a safe haven for sure. It was a ring of protection. There was co-offending with Denham and Picken up in Tari. We know Peter Brock, Father Peter Brock was co-offending. I mean, just imagine it. You had The director of Catholic schools was a child sex offender during the 70s, 80s. You had the principal of St Pius X, you had the principal of Morris Brothers, Maitland and Hamilton, all sex offenders plus clusters. You know, there's about 40 or 50 offenders. I also think the state institutions at the time, weren't. they left it to the church because they thought, oh, we couldn't, there's no way the church could be doing anything like that. So what happened when Glenn eventually wrote a letter of complaint outlining what happened to him. How did the church respond? So what happens to Glenn is he he becomes a priest. So here's Glenn. He's been sent to Lochinvar and Brankston Parish and, woe behold, the priest he's replacing has been arrested. You know, it's about the third or fourth time and his anger's just rising. He's He's been a victim. He understands all this. But this becomes really personal for Glenn because... Father James Fletcher is arrested for sexually assaulting a boy called Daniel Feenan and Glenn knows the Feenans and has spent holidays with them and he's close to Daniel. And then he finds out from the sister of another boy that her brother was also sexually abused by Fletcher but this other boy hasn't gone to the police and and he's, he's reticent. And Glenn knows in his heart unless he reports this to the police and he gets Brendan to go to the police that Daniel is likely not to get a conviction in the courts. It's very hard when you're the only victim. So he convinces Brendan to go to the police and he goes to the police. In his testimony to an inquiry, Glenn said that he rang the bishop and said, I'm going to the police to report this new victim. He testifies that the bishop said to him, if you do that, you can fuck off out of my diocese. Anyway, he goes and reports it. The bishop now denies he ever says that. From that moment on, Glenn is a pariah. He realises he's a pariah. He ends up living in his car. He has to leave the diocese. However, they get the conviction. In the end, six victims come forward. And it goes all the way to the High Court, causes a precedent. It's, It's a brilliant day for victims. But Glenn's life deteriorates from that point. That's basically 
where things really unravel for him. He's shunned and ostracised. He comes to Sydney. He's told by a senior clergyman that Cardinal Pell thinks he's a disaster. And But then another inquiry happens called the Canine Inquiry in New South Wales and he's called to be a witness because they're investigating clerical abuse cover-up up there. And the church's lawyers really just attack him and he's just, you know, but he gives evidence. And because of his evidence against Father James Fletcher and an Archbishop, Wilson, through that inquiry, he becomes a Crown Prosecution witness. Archbishop Wilson is charged with concealment for covering up what he knew about Fletcher. He's eventually acquitted, but at that point he's it's the highest cleric in Australia at that point to be charged with cover-up. And Glenn, a priest is the Crown Prosecution Witnesses. This doesn't happen around the world. Mm. Priests are never going to be Crown Prosecution Witnesses against an Archbishop. Curiously, a year later, the Royal Commission's about to report and Glenn gets recalled to meet the Pope and Glenn tells four or five of his confidants that the Pope asks him about what he's going to say in this trial. Now, he is a Crown Prosecution Witness at this point. He also tells his former lawyer that and his current lawyer that. He also tells his former and current lawyer that when he emerged from the meeting with the Pope, Cardinal Pell was standing outside and said to him, you know, look what I've done to you and puts out his ring for Glenn to kiss it and Glenn doesn't kiss it, he walks away because he's totally disillusioned by this point. Mm. And then there's another year where the case is building up, the media is talking about this priest, Glenn Walsh, In February of 2017, he returns to Hamilton and they give him a house and they actually start treating him well. But then it all unravels really badly and by sort of August of 2017, the Marists suddenly get in contact with him and say, oh dear, sorry, we've decided that um, we're going to reverse your case with Brother Coleman Sykes and we now sustain it. So we want to do mediation with you. Now this really angers Glenn because it not only... He's thinking, why are they bringing this up two months before I'm to give evidence in a major trial against an archbishop? He thinks, are they destabilising me? Is it just a coincidence? Are they trying to do the right thing? It really gets to him and destabilises because he's worried that this whole thing is going to upset his parents. It's the shame. It's all He's worried he's going to be in the spotlight again. So he's due to go to court around the 20th of November 2017. The end of October, he writes to uh, a close friend and says, I've just had a visit from Bishop Bill Wright, the bishop, and he's told me I'm no longer welcome and I've got to leave the diocese and there's no place for me here. Within a week, he's dead. The Maris brothers get in touch with him and say, we want to have a mediation with you about your claim on the 7th of November, and he suicides on the 6th. But before he suicides... He sends all the documents from the Maris Brothers' claim all about Coman Sykes to a close friend and says, keep it safe. She believes he wanted it to come out. When the police arrive at his house, he shredded every document in his house. All the bins are overflowing with shredded documents. He's dressed up in his full priestly garb in his bed. And I believe he was making a statement. Mm. Because why would you dress in your priestly robes? The trial went ahead. Archbishop Philip Wilson was convicted and then he got off on appeal. He was acquitted. But when you read my book, there's a lot more to those last two years, the pressure that was put on him, Mm. the bullying. What happens to someone on a stand and and you can't imagine. And Stephen. And then Stephen. And then Stephen contacts me and says, Susie, um, because we we worked together at the ABC, he was my boss and a brilliant journalist, and he, he contacts me and says, Susie, you really should investigate. Glenn Walsh's death, I knew him, I grew up with him from the age of two. And I go, oh, wow, because I'd heard about this priest. I'd done about 40 stories up there for Late Line in the previous years. And I agreed to meet with Stephen in a month or so because I was going to Hawaii for a holiday. It was the end of the year. He was going to Chile. And then when I sort of came back in January, I went to contact him and Stephen had suicided. And I just felt like... Some, there's something more to this because he had brilliant editorial now as a journalist and then it led me to write this book and that's what the book's about and they're, they're all interconnected. Stephen had actually written a character reference for the man who abused him which speaks to the extent of 
the grooming really and the relationships that these men forged with their victims years and years after the violence was was committed in in what context did he write that character reference and and what did he say about him so this speaks of the psychological torture that these victims go through with priests and brothers so denim used to go on these pedophilic sprees he had a pedophilic smog sport he was just sent to all these parishes it was shocking It finally catches up with him when in 1996 a student, ex-student from Waverley College in the city goes to the police and is charged with having sex with a boy under the age of 18. That was on the statute then, it's not there anymore. But he gets off and then he's charged again by a boy from St Pius X, which is where Stephen went. And Denham rings up Stephen in 1997 and Stephen's now the head of Radio National. And Denham says, would you write me a reference on ABC Letterhead and Stephen goes to his partner Mark and says oh I don't feel comfortable about that I'll I'll just do it in my own personal letterhead and Mark was very worried he never liked Denim and didn't understand why Denim was always in Stephen's life and kept being in his life anyway Stephen wrote this reference and Stephen was a real literary person he wrote books and words were really important to him and he tended that to this court case Now, Denham was convicted on that particular court case, but Stephen never found out about it. He just thought he was acquitted and it was never covered in the media. It wasn't until 2006-07 when he was charged with 18 boys. They were all under the age of 14. The other thing Denham did to Stephen, when he asked for the reference, he said, I'm having a consensual affair with a 17-year-old boy. And that was bullshit. It wasn't. The boy was 14. That was the case for the Waverley, but not for the pious. So he manipulated and he lied. And then Stephen, when he found out, you know, who was who, who so felt for these poor victims that he'd somehow written this reference for this monster. And Denham almost made it out like it was he was being targeted in an act of homophobia mm. because he was having a relationship with a boy, which appealed to Stephen. Because he's he, gay. Yes, yeah, thinking that that's something that he would like to protect him from, but of course it was actually sinister, the relationship. I wanted to return to Andrew and his mother. What did she discover years later about what could have taken place on that on that beach when she recalled him coming home and and acting a little strangely? What she found out since? It turned out that Brother Romuald used to take the boys for swimming lessons. And he would sexually abuse boys, but also this particular day he undressed in the dressing shed and displayed a full erection to all the boys and said, look, this is what happens when you're aroused. And when one of the boys said, you know, you're disgusting, put it away, there was about 40 boys in the room, he said, look, I'm just teaching you what your fathers, you know, should be teaching you. I mean, (laughs) it's just unbelievable. And... Also, it's turned out that some of Andrew's friends have come forward now and Romuald has been charged and convicted and he's in jail. And he was only charged again the day the book came out on August 21 with more offences. So, And what sort of offences are they? Child sexual, you know, sexual and assault. So beyond that event where he exposed yes. himself to so, those children. And to the head of the Maris Brothers' credit, Brother Peter Carroll has apologised to Audrey Nash and the Nash family and says... It is absolutely beyond doubt that Brother Romuald and maybe one or two more had sexually assaulted Andrew over quite a period of time at Morris Brothers Hamilton and they've apologised, which was a very good thing for Peter Carroll to do because what I've found with a lot of the families, particularly of the ones, the 71 men who've suicided, they just want answers. You know, they've got grown kids now that have left behind and... What I wanted to do was try and make this a healing thing that, you know, one of the men who's who died is called Bernie O'Brien and at the age of 17 or 18 he lived at St Pius with those priests and it's not a boarding school. His family sent him to live for a year in the priest's quarters and he suddenly suicides in uh, 2009, 2010 and he had a nine-year-old daughter and Izzy now came to my book launch and she's studying English and journalism and her wonderful mother Ruth 
and, you know, Denham was there when he was there and all those priests. So what we're hoping is that some of these families get some answers. And it does look as though when these stories are told, whether it's in, in the media or in books, people find recognition and solidarity in knowing they weren't the only one. It seems to give people the courage to come forward and say, I was one of those boys too, rather than being the first. As you say, it takes for Glenn to come forward and say he was the first, he, he was completely turned on. But with these cases, it's proven that, that these men did it. And so it, hopefully it will provide a lot of explanation for men but also their families because, as you say, so many lives have been lost and a lot of them with no no answers. There is no, you know, no... Remember Stephen's last words in that letter to Denham. I met you, as kids often do, thinking, what a good teacher. How much could I learn? What an utter betrayal. I went to you when I realised I was gay at 19 to seek some sort of guidance. Not knowing you, a priest, would be gay, just thinking you might be able to guide me in some way. And we stayed in ways connected over more than 30 years. I could not believe that I had missed what you have done and how I had not realised who I had been sitting across at bars and at the tables. This is what betrayal looks like. And I am what collateral damage looks like. The Green Senator in New South Wales, David Shoebridge, has referred the 71 deaths, including Father Glenn Walsh's death, to the coroner. And the families have asked for an inquest. And I think that would be fantastic because... Not that they're pushing for another inquiry, but to understand the effect and the impact on this community of what went on back then and what we need to do now to stop more suicides. It's really Mm. important that we get men talking and get men help that have been through this. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for taking an interest. It's really important. Thank you. You'll find a link to Suzanne Smith's book, Alter Boys, in the show notes of this episode. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens. Our producer is Lem Zakaria. If you'd like to find out more about the show, don't forget to join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join. <laughs>